welcome to Off The Shelf Reviews. I was howling at this one. And I'm Gary. And today we're going to review and discuss The Howling, which came out in 1981, based on the novel by Gary Brandner, first draft written by Terence Winkless, and the final draft written by John Sayles, and directed by Joe Dante. Ian, why don't you give us the synopsis? Well, the story follows Karen White, played by Dee Wallace. She's a news reporter for a New York news channel, and she's been receiving calls from Eddie, a serial killer tormenting the city. After confronting Eddie and seeing him get killed by the police, Karen continues to have nightmares about what she saw that night. But Dr. Wagner, played by Patrick McNee, convinces her to go to the colony and to spend a weekend relaxing. But Karen may find out that the colony and Eddie have a much more sinister connection. I'm gonna light up your whole body, Karen. You know, werewolf movies have been a part of cinema since the early days of cinema. Oh, going yeah. Going all the way back to the silent movie era. Yeah. I believe the very first werewolf movie was called The Werewolf, released in 1913. Wow. Uh, unfortunately, uh, there was a fire at Universal Studios' uh, backlot somewhere, and a lot of original silent movies were all destroyed, and so there are yeah. no, no copies remaining of this film barring just a couple of posters. Wow. Uh, but, you know, werewolf movies evolved over time. Yeah. And uh, the, the next real big one was The Wolfman in 1941 yeah. uh, with Lon Chaney Jr. in the role. Yeah. And then, of course, he would reprise that role in many more Universal Monster movies, uh, including The House of Dracula in 1945, where we got, you know, the first real sort of face transformation of a werewolf. Yeah. You know, and then things evolved again uh, in 1973 with The Boy Who Cried Wolf. Yeah. Uh, and then, you know, right in the early 80s, we had films like Wolfen, where it was, instead of using werewolves or, or, or makeup effects, they literally just kind of cheated and, and had dogs. <laughs> you know, it was just dogs or, or, or wolves. Well, or... like cat people. Remember that movie? <laughs> they, they use real cats. And Joe Dante was just like, he's looking at this whole history of werewolf movies and he's like, you know what? There is not a good modern transformation in these films. You never see the transformation happen in camera. And that was why he was drawn to this project. You know, he's like, uh, he graduated from the Roger Corman School of Making Movies. Yeah, yeah. He had some moderate success with Piranha. Yeah. And uh, he was currently working on Jaws 3. And he was, <laughs> and, and, and Joe Dante was like, you know what? I'm not doing Jaws 3. I'm going to go and do, oh, I'm going to go and do The Howling instead. Man, he should have done Jaws He should have done Jaws Well, that was because the original director and for uh, The Howling was let go. He had creative differences. He wanted yeah. to do things closer to the book. Yeah. When Joe Dante got brought on, he looked at the script and went, I don't like this. As a matter of fact, I don't even like the book. And he went on record as, as, as saying that, which really upset the, uh, the guy who wrote the original novel. Well, yeah. Because the novel has a much darker darker, grittier tone to it. And Joe Dante kind of wanted to add some levity and 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 kind of override some of the darker, rapier, monstery moments in the film. Yeah, yeah. You know, he wanted to Joe Dante it up. Yeah. Uh, and so that's why he brought in the screenwriter that he worked with on Piranha, who was currently working on the script for Alligator, yeah. uh, to, to rewrite the script and, and change a lot of things. So there's a lot of major differences between this and and the source material. Well, saying that, I I'd never known that the Howling was based on a book until obviously I wikied it and I was getting prepared to re, uh, do the review. And then I wikied the book, and other than the beginning, you know, uh, there are for me. I'm looking at the book and I'm like, hey, the film hits these beat for beats. You have a a, a woman who's gone through a traumatizing event you know it's starting to affect her relationship with her husband and they are both convinced to go to this oh in the book it's a village yes. in, in, the, in the film it's a colony and when they get there they realize that there's sinister motives going on with the people living in this area and they're all connected to what's happened at the beginning and and you know like you said i just think it's funny because it, to me it doesn't seem like joe dante really changed a lot you know and we were discussing this before we turned the cameras on. I've never found the howling funny. 
And weirdly enough, you know, it's weird to say that with Joe Dante because a lot of his stuff does have like a bit of a layer of black humor in there. Like, ha, 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 didn't you get that joke? And I'm like, no, no, I did not. It was too violent, you know? <laughs> But for me, I've seen The Howling, uh, this is probably the third time I've actually watched it in the whole time I've uh, been alive. And I rarely, I rarely go to The Howling series for my horror, especially my werewolf horror. The Howling for me, especially the series, is at least maybe three or four on my on my werewolf list. You know, there's one I'll go to, you know, and but I try to avoid the moors, you know, and there's another one I go to up on the Scottish island with a bunch of soldiers, and I try to remember there's no spoon. And then I and then I might watch The Howling. But, like, the film starts off really, really well. You know, you've, you've just, you've got those howls, you've got the ripping of fabric and the, the title card appearing on, on screen. And then you just get this news report over the credits and you start to garner, you know, information that there's been a bunch of murders going on in the city and the police have no idea or what's going on. These people look like they've been attacked by animals. They've been attacked and eaten. Well, that's the thing that this film did very well on its initial release was that, you know, Joe Dante and, and, the, and the producers told the advertising company... Do not sell this film as a werewolf movie. We want that to be a surprise. Yeah, yeah. And so you know the the trailer and and you know and the beginning of the film, it, it it's kind of masquerading as as a crime thriller. Mm. You know, it's almost documentary esque in in many ways. Um, and so you know the the werewolf stuff starts getting dropped in as the film goes on until you know there's no doubt about it. It's a, it's a werewolf movie. Well, that's it. Like the like. If this is if this is your first time watching The Howling, you really have to wait until the end to get it all. But if this is like your third, fourth, fifth, you pick up these little things, especially when you've got uh, Robert Picardo playing Eddie, and like he's the EMH from Voyager. Yeah, you know he's, he's, he's the, the cowboy, cowboy from <laughs> Inner Space. Like I, I, I sometimes have problems watching the howling and seeing him as a threat you know because i keep expecting him to ask me what is the status know, those, of those the... johnny cabs are pretty frightening <laughs> yeah. but he we we then get d wallace you know she's walking through the streets of new york and we're actually what towards the end of this investigation that, that you know she's been getting these phone calls from eddie you know, kind of like the Zodiac talking to her about the people that he's killed and, you know, how he likes her or is infatuated with her or whatever. And the police have hooked her up with a wire and she's supposed to go to a phone booth to get information. Yeah, that phone call, a conversation, the extreme close-up of, yeah. of Eddie's mouth as he's kind of licking his lips in anticipation. It's really creepy. Uh, but there's just a small uh, Easter egg here for you. Uh, yeah. That uh, it's Roger Corman <laughs> who's waiting to get into the phone booth. And, you know, Joe Dante has said that he should have cut it. But they, they, they really loved the gag of him walking in there and then checking for quarters. <laughs> yeah, because he, he he's money. known as a penny pincher. <laughs> it's just like, it's fine. Like, it's fine. The nods in this film, there are, there are a million, you know, and Gary's probably got them all knocked down but i was looking back and i was like oh really oh that's that's awesome i love that d wallace man there's not many horror actresses whose whose face and voice really just she's stick. a bit of a scream queen she is you she know is. from cujo and yeah. the hills have eyes oh critters she was the mum in critters man you know it's like i can't i can't i can't believe it I'm, at the same time you know this woman you know she's the mum in et you know and and to think as well, I loved her her performance in the Frighteners, right? You know, as as the serial killer that works with Gary Busey. You know, and she 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 looks innocent, but she also has this look in her eye like she'd happily just stab you in the back if she needs to survive. But she plays the innocent. I always find really really well. And she walks to this sex theater. You know, Eddie's told her to go here and they're going to talk, you know, because he wants to show her something. And she's under the idea that she's actually protected because her husband, Billy, played by uh, Christopher Stone, you know, he's waiting back at the uh, television station uh, with the police and her work colleagues. I want to bring up now, I could not believe this. I love it when we do this with film reviews. Dennis Dugan who plays Chris. Now, at this point, 
like I was I was oblivious to all of this. So Dennis Dugan played in An Astronaut in King Arthur's Court, which is one of my all time favorite Disney movies. It's about an astronaut who goes back in time to King Arthur's Court. And he's in this, you know, he plays Chris in The Howling. And then he'd go on to direct like four or five bloody Adam Sandler movies in the future. I think that's the most horrifying thing about this whole film, that this is what this man would go to do. <laughs> like four, three or four of them. I won't list them because Gary is just terrified. But anyway. Karen gets to the the sex theater. It was a real location as well, and uh, the the actress she said that she you know she she's a Kansas girl, yeah. country girl, and it made her incredibly uncomfortable because it was a real location. Yeah, it felt yeah. really seedy, really perverted, made her incredibly uncomfortable. And I was like, well, that works. She's almost method acting here. Uh, that's it. You, know, you really get a sense of her vulnerability. Like she she really doesn't want to be there, but she's doing this for the police, for you know for for all the people that have been attacked and um and she goes in and she sits in the booth and we don't see anybody else come in but eddie's already there and like it was it was kind of awkward him putting the quarter in and then you just start having this sex show start to show but it's it's amazing that you know there there's a dark cd place in pretty much any city around the world where there's a booth like this where you can go watch this or all the hot dirty seedy people will hide and he's talking to her and robert picardo this this exchange like you you realize that the police have realized that there's something up and they need to get someone to her location as quickly as they can you know this is the 80s they don't have mobile phones or gps they literally have you know their their skills of knowing where people go and he's talking and he's talking about how he wants to show her something and then you can hear the breaking of bones or the ripping of flesh or something going on behind her. And of course, it's all silhouette. So, yeah. you know, we don't really get to see it. And then he asks her to turn around. Turn around, my card. I want to give you something. And of course, the you know, she can't even scream. You know, she's like panic ridden. But the police have found her location. They inter they asked questions yeah. uh, to some of the, the street walkers. And they were like, oh, she went that way. And they just go in, guns guns blazing. Uh, well, well, I, I got to point out, Kenneth Toby, who plays the older cop, who was the uh, leader in uh, The Thing From Another World. He was the, the, the sergeant in charge. He didn't fire anything. No, 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 it's the rookie. Yeah, right. The rookie just pulled his gun out and just blown away. But, you know, as a, as a, as a, a fan, you know, if you're a horror fan, and like I said, if this isn't your first time watching this movie, you kind of know, you kind of know what's happened. You know, you've heard that ripping noise before. Right. <laughs> I don't know what happened in there. I don't, I don't remember. We keep cutting to Patrick McNee uh, playing Dr. Wagner. Uh, Patrick McNee. A legend in his legend, own Legend, like the, vo the voice alone. Like, I could name a million things that he's been in, but I'll always remember him as the Imperious leader from Battlestar Galactica. And um, he's, he's trying to sell his book, uh, the book about the gift, you know, and he starts to have these, uh, like, sessions with Karen, which I think is a bit weird that, you know, she's just gone through this massive traumatic event. You know, she's kind of like the closest thing to a witness to this killer who's been going around. And this random doctor who everybody well, seems to love. He's a psychiatrist, you know. And he's he's really... not the only psychiatrist in the whole city, is he? Well, they seem to have almost like a friendship as well, you know. <laughs> yeah, well, I'll get to my issues with that, but... <laughs> it's like she, they're trying to find out from Karen what she saw. But she's blacked it all out. She can't yeah. remember it. It's too harrowing an experience for her to recall. Yeah. And so he invites her to his uh, his special retreat where he's taken a whole bunch of patients and, you know, and it's an ongoing recovery process for them. Yeah, all of different ages. 
yeah. different walks of life. Oh, it's definitely uh, filled with lots of odd bod kind oh, of characters. Oh, surely, totally. yeah. And uh, I think she resists at first, but she's having romantic issues with her with her husband at the time. Yes, yeah. Uh, and so she kind of reluctantly agrees to go. Yeah, and and they head out to they head out to this colony, and at the same time we're following uh, Chris and Terry, uh, Dennis Dugan's character and his girlfriend, who are investigating the background of Eddie. And so they like they go to his apartment in the city, and they realize that he's gotten paper clippings all over his room, detailing all the different murders that he's done, and the, uh, and Karen drawings of of wolf people, you know, or hairy people. And he's specifically, he's got this one picture of what appears to be a beach, uh, you know, a, a drawing overlooking a beach. And so he's got some artistic talent. Saint shame he was a complete raving psychopath. But then when you get to the colony, you kind of realise where he's come from. You know, because you've got people like... You've got Elizabeth Brooks playing uh, Marsha Quist, Eddie's sister. She makes her first appearance, doesn't she? Oh, yes. Yeah, like... If she doesn't scream nymphomaniac at you, I don't know what does. You know? But you've also got, like, TC, her brother, who is feral? Pretty much, yeah. You know? Yeah. I, I, like... He's definitely not trying to hide his animalistic instincts whatsoever. No, you know. But then you get one of my favourites in there. You've got uh, John Carradine. Oh, God. <laughs> he's playing Earl Kenton, you know. And John Carradine, he's a, he's a, a legend in his own right, yeah. playing uh, Dracula, uh, like, uh, several times in uh, in Universal's horror movies. Yeah, and the, his, his acting towards the fire, you know, and the silhouettes... He just, he, he he's mumbling to himself for quite a bit. And then he just wants to throw himself into the fire. He's given up. He's, he's just, he's had enough. He just wants to kill himself. Which I, like, I, I'll, I'll try to come back to this question. But I have a question involving that mentality towards him. Um, because I love the first night when they settled da down. I mean, D Wallace, just, I think this... Uh, this sequence alone just shows how amazing Dean Wallace was or and or Joe Dante at the same time because she wakes up in her cabin and she can hear howling and she heads over to the window to kind of look out there and between the camera work of Joe Dante showing us this misty forest this moonlit misty forest moonlit yeah. misty forest and the look on Dee Wallace's face as she's looking out there and we can kind of hear the howling you know I'm like, man, if I heard that, if I was somewhere and I heard that, I'd be locking the windows, I'd be locking the door, I'd be pushing the chest of drawers in front of it and climbing under a bag of billy. Like, don't ever well, she, does, she, she, she runs, <laughs> runs to her, uh, her fiancé, her husband, and she's just like, uh, there's something out there, there's something out there. And he's like, oh, calm down, you're a city girl, we're in the country, you're going to hear wild dogs and coyotes. I heard people, like, making weird noises. Well, of course we did. Yeah, <laughs> like... But then of course, she's just like, oh, she believes it. Because she's like, well, I've never lived out in the country. Yeah. So the next morning, Karen and her next door neighbor, Donna, you know, they, they're talking to the uh, local sheriff played by Slim Pickings. What kind of name is that? <laughs> it's an awesome name. Like... Miss Pickings, what would you like to name your son? Well, Slim, you know, <laughs> and he he's trying to play this whole friendly sheriff of, oh, maybe it's just coyotes out there. Yeah. You know, we'll have to get together and get the coyotes. And then we get that sequence where, you know, Karen and, and Donna are just, they're just sat out in the forest. It's getting late at night. And they're like, oh, what's that noise? And I'm like, run. <laughs> don't, don't sit there. But it seems like the people at the colony are comfortable with the weirdness going around them. It's like they're yeah. used to this happening all the time. And Karen's not, but she's... Uh, it's it's weird. It's kind of contradictory. She's brave enough to just put herself into these dangerous situations, but then she can't handle what happens next. Right. You know, right. so like her and Donna, they go wandering out. She says to Donna, like, oh, does, does your man have that rifle? And she's like, yeah, he does. Okay. And that's what they do. These, these two women, unarmed, go off, get a rifle... I don't know if any of them can shoot. Well, we saw them doing target practice or shooting earlier, so they were hunting rabbit. Yeah, yeah, but it's like, but it's, it's these two random women, they haven't told anybody. 
you know, and they're walking out into these woods and they come across a cow that's had its throat slit or it's caught itself in the barbed wire, but it's, this cow's dead, you know, and the battery dies on the torch. And they're like, oh my God, we're completely lost. And that's what I mean. They're like, hey, get a rifle and we'll go out and find this animal. Oh God, we're lost. <laughs> oh, God, Donna. You know, we're stuck out here in the middle of Timbuktu someplace. Watch that gun. God! But luckily the sheriff turns up with Donna's husband and rescues them. And, you know, the guys decide that they're going to go out looking for coyotes because this must be a problem. So they decide to take with them uh, Billy, you know, make him one of the boys, yep, you yep. know, and make, make him feel welcome. And I'm like, how long do you plan on staying at this fucking colony? Well, until she's, you know, at least a couple of weeks. That was the intention. Ah, like, she's got a job to go back to. I mean, she's got, got time off. <laughs> well, yeah, she was being hunted by a serial killer. But Billy goes out and he kills a bunch of rabbits and then he just doesn't know what to do with them because he doesn't eat meat. Right, yeah. You know, he's not a meat eater. And TC convinces Billy to take the rabbits to Marsha. You know, like, that's not going to make an uncomfortable conversation with his <laughs> wife when you get back to her. It's that moment when he does go to Marsha's and she starts skinning the rabbit. She, you know, hatchets off the rabbit paw and chucks yeah. it to him. And he's just like, what do I do with that? <laughs> you know, and then, you know, she, she, she's a very forward lady. Yeah. And uh, she, she makes a pass at him. And, of course, he resists and pushes her off and kind of runs home. <laughs> <laughs> but on his way home, he gets jumped by by something. Yes. Can't quite make out what it is. Mm, something <laughs> large and hairy. And... <laughs> it's teeth and fangs. <laughs> uh, but, of course, he... Uh, he, he takes an injury and uh, and then he has to you know get get patched up when when he goes home and which is a bit uncomfortable because it's like Karen's there like no we need to get you out of here and Doctor Wagner's like no I don't think that's a good idea okay I'm like well he's the authority figure here so we listen to what he says because he hasn't led us wrong yet <laughs> yeah. in the meantime we keep cutting back to uh, to Terry and Chris yeah and uh, you know they're doing you know they've gone to the uh, to the morgue yeah, yeah. and uh, they were talking to the uh, the writer of the film <laughs> who's playing the, the mortician there and uh, he, he, he he's going on and on about something or other and they open up Eddie's uh, you know um, the drawer that he's, that he's yeah, the they, they, yeah they open up Eddie's drawer and the body's missing. Yeah. And they can see claw mark and scratch marks on the inside. And they're like, oh, well, that's not normal. <laughs> yeah, it's like... No, oh, but you you start to garner the information from outside the colony by Terry and Chris. You yeah. know, they'll go to... They go to a bookstore run by the awesome Dick Miller. i got to point out here, Dick Miller is yet again reprising the role yeah. of Walter Paisley. Oh, the, the, from Chopping Mall. From Chopping Mall, <laughs> from Bucket of Blood... <laughs> Um, I believe he also played Walter Paisley in an early, earlier Joe Dante movie. Yeah. Uh, you just like, you know, any film that, yeah, well, Dick Miller's appeared in pretty much every uh, Joe Dante movie yeah, anyway. I was going to say, yeah. And I, I, I love his little bit because, you know, most of the time you just see him as a comedy actor or just some guy stood in the background who's going to get killed. But in this, he's really quite informative. And I, he, he gives us the information that... And you have to be specific with this information when you're talking about the howling. Is that, you know, there there's differences between werewolves and shapeshifters. A classic werewolf could change shape any time it wants, day and night, whenever it takes a notion to. That's why I call them shapeshifters. I got a dozen books on it. What about killing it with silver bullets? Well, sure. Silver bullets are fire. It's the only way to get rid of the damn things. A shapeshifter can do it whenever they choose. But they specifically will only change into wolves. You know, I'm sure there's lore out there that says that shapeshifters can change into anything that they want over years of well, practicing and training, blah, blah, blah. The way Joe Dante explained it was just like in, in older movies, like Universal movies with yeah. with Dracula and with the and with the, the the Wolfman, you know, they would always say like, oh, vampires, they can't turn into bats and wolves. That's preposterous. No, no, and that no, was vampires, because... Yeah the film didn't have the budget to turn them into wol into wolves or bats. Yeah. So for their lore, they can't do it, you know? And it's like, oh, you know, vampires, they've got reflections in mirrors. That was because they probably didn't know how to mask a reflection in the mirror. Yeah, yeah. And so Joe Dante was like, our script happens in a couple of days. I can't wait each bloody month for a full moon no, no, you to can't. do werewolf you transformation. So he was yeah. just like, oh, werewolves can transform whenever they want. Yeah. Um, and so, yeah, that, you know, so you basically, you just make up the lore 
that suits the film story that you're making. Which, you know, there is no concrete lore of a werewolf, vampire, etc., etc. You know, and if it, it, the lore is whatever your film says it is. Yeah, yeah. As long as you don't break it, it's fine. I, I, I get that. I just, I feel though that, the, you know, they, they had this idea, that especially when they have the source material of the book. You know, they're following as closely as I can, in my opinion, a representation of the book. But it's then the the additional stuff, the politics side that comes along, which then starts to make me question the whole what's going on in the background or why the director isn't going into the stuff in the background. Um, but like I said, I'll try to get to that because Terry and Chris ha have realized that Eddie's body is missing and they've gotten some books from Dick Miller regarding about shape sh shapeshifters and werewolves. And Terry has been called by Karen to go up to the colony. And Chris is like, look, I'll be up there in a couple of days. And it turns out that Karen and Billy are really coming to loggerheads at this point because she tries to come on to Billy and he kind of pushes her away because he's not interested in her. Um, and he wanders out into the woods on his own in the middle of the fucking night. And while there, he comes across Marsha. And the two of them start to just get it on in front of this fire. Yeah, it's a very horny sequence. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> uh, you know, you've got the camp lit fire, you've got the moonlight, you've got the mist. You've got the animal howls. You've got the animal howls. And yeah, it's a, it's a, it's a pretty raunchy uh, sequence. And, you know, it gets, uh, it gets hot. Yeah. You know, once the transformations start and they really start howling. Yeah. Because, <laughs> because, like I said, this is where you go to realize is that they, you know, Marsha is a uh, Marsha is a happy shapeshifter. She she loves turning into a wolf, you know, and she also loves turning into a human and then using that to move around during the day. And, like, is she, she just wants Billy. Yeah. You know, she's not in love with him. She's just a nymphomaniac animal, you know, and she, she couldn't get him in her human form. So slashing him, you know, makes him more, makes him... And turns him into the animal. Turns him into the animal. And when the two of them start to get at it, like... The uh, there, I mean, there is a questionable effect at the end of the sequence. Yes, that's what I was going to uh, say. But that was because you know this film ran out of money very, very quickly. They shot the whole fi the whole film in twenty eight days, yeah. including reshoots that that had wow. to happen. Uh, you know, they had no money to do all of the effects, and so it was just a very quick animated sequence. You yeah, know, and it's only on screen for a few seconds, and you're like, yeah, it's ropey by today's but, standards. But, but you get enough. I will say, in the film's defence, you get enough between Billy and and Marsha kind of just lying on the floor, roaring with their fangs and their and their eyes changing, for you to know, as a fan of horror movies, that they are changing into animals. And so, yeah, when you get that little cartoony bit towards the end, I'm like, ah, fuck it, I'm already in. Yeah. <laughs> I'm already deep, deep into this motherfucking movie. I'm going with it. <laughs> but Terry turns up and starts to go and talk to Karen um, and she hears the howls during the night while Billy and Marsha are having sex and so Terry heads out to the the, the, the coast and as she's walking and she, she's listened to the howls and she wants to contact her boyfriend and then she sees the image that they'd seen at Eddie's yeah. at the beach. So the connection has been instantly made. That Eddie, you know, Eddie Quist related to Marsha, has been here at the colony. And so the, the, the doctor must know something. Yeah. But then she's lured to a house. Yeah. Uh, I just want to bring up here the... Um, the One of the art directors for this film... Yeah. ...was Robert A. Burns. Right. And he was the prop guy for Texas Chainsaw Massacre. Uh... And so he borrowed or, or took all the props from that film... And a lot of them re-emerged in the howling, especially when you've got all of the bones the dangling, bones hanging on the all of the fur things, you know, stapled to the walls. I, I did read somewhere as well, if you look at the bookstore, you can see the old granny yes, in the, the chair. Yes, the old granny's in the chair. Exactly. <laughs> I'm like, just like, oh, it's, it's the same universe. <laughs> so many notes. <laughs> but yeah, Terry's lured into this house and she starts to see evidence of somebody must be living there, especially somebody who must 
be like Eddie because the same pictures are appearing. And she's attacked by something, something large and hairy. Um, and it chases her underneath the house, but she manages to grab an axe and cuts the creature's arm off, forces it to run away. <laughs> I loved this effect. Yeah. The it, effect of the arm turning back. Bubbling and boiling and rolling over and then you see the human fingers emerging and that's what sets her off. Yeah. She's like, that That was a human. That was a human and removing the body part has now turned it back to its normal, uh, normal form. And so she races back to the doctor's office to try to call Chris. And while she's got Chris on the phone, she's looking for information on Eddie. Um, I fucking died. Like some, I've, I swear I've read somewhere that people consider the Howling, Howling one, a comedy, a black comedy. I personally don't see it myself, but there are, as Gary says, there are Joe Dante isms in there that people might think are incredibly funny, especially the bit where the werewolf arm comes along and takes the folder off of her. Yes. You know, <laughs> like, I don't know how big that room is. I haven't really worked it out, but somehow he managed to get into the room, change and then wait there while she goes for the file. I was like, oh, I'm no, not that one. Sorry. <laughs> that one's mine. That one's mine. <laughs> it's a, it's an awesome scene. This is the oh, first time yeah. we really get to see Rob Bottin's work here. Yeah. Now, uh, it, it should be said that um, Rick Baker was the original uh, designer yeah. uh, for the film. But uh, ten, or, uh, maybe 10 years prior to this, uh, he said he had a, had a deal uh, with John Landis. Yeah, John yeah. Landis wanted to make a, a werewolf movie. <laughs> and uh, he got wind of, about the talents of Rick Baker and said, we will do this. Yeah. But like, as as Rick Baker said, he kept waiting and waiting and waiting and waiting for him to give the call that we're going to make this movie. Yeah. And so then when Rick Baker got the call to go and work on The Howling, he was like, well, if John Landis doesn't want my werewolf stuff, I will take it over to here for Joe Dante. <laughs> and he starts working on The Howling. I'm guessing the other studios got wind yeah. that uh, there was a werewolf movie in production and they were like, hey, John Landis, that werewolf movie you wanted to do, you can finally do it. Yeah. So John Landis was like, oh, i got to get hold of Rick Baker. <laughs> hey, Rick Baker, we're going to do that werewolf movie. And Rick Baker's like, oh, I'm doing a werewolf movie. He was like, how dare you? Get over here now. You promised you'd do what you can do for me. So he was like, I'm sorry, Joe Dante. I've, I promised my friend I'm going to go do this movie. So I'm going to leave now. Bye. I'm going to go do another werewolf movie instead. And, and so they had Rob Bottin. <laughs> Uh, there who, you know, he's a perfectionist, you uh, know, and uh, he, he delayed production several times. He was like, it's not ready yet. It's not ready yet. It's not ready yet. How much money have I got? I can't do it with that much money, but here we go. <laughs> yeah. And he would, and was it, Rob Boutine would go from this into fil getting another film released in 1982, you know, with his great special effects. And we know that at the same time of this year, another werewolf movie would come out, I think, August you know, where, where The Howling came out in March. So there's there's like a whole period of the 19... Between 1980 and eight end of 1982, where special effects artists were like, running all over the trip. Oh, absolutely. Yeah. It was a revolutionary period. It really pushed the boundaries of special effects in movies yeah, so yeah. far forward. And, and that's what I love about this. I mean, um, Robert Picardo playing the big wolf, Eddie's wolf against Terry. Like... I forgot how he doesn't gory, gorily kill her. Yeah, he. I mean, like you get to. See, I mean, you get the the, the shots of of, uh, of the werewolf's legs, which, yeah. which are awesome. Oh, it's dog soldiers yeah, level. Yeah, oh, absolutely. Fucking, you know, um, six, and, seven and, foot you know, and then when you get the shot of the wolf very quickly with Terry suspended in the air, you like you see how, it, it looks so effortlessly how he's yeah, oh, yeah. her up. Yeah, yeah. You know, she she can't even flail around too much, and it's just one bite to the throat. We see some it, blood landing on the papers. But that's it. It's not even like a gore. It, to me, it's like a vampire bite. It is, yeah. Like, it's, like he it seems just gentle. leans over and he just, yeah, he just gently just bites her on the neck, knowing he's going to kill her. But he's not eating her. She's not a meal. You know, and it, it harkens back to like the beginning where Eddie was wanting yeah, to... It's the serial killer nature of him almost, where he enjoys the terror and the panic and oh, yeah, the fear. Oh, yeah, yeah. But it was like, in my mind, I'm like, was is that what he was going to do to Karen? You know, because like he didn't, he wanted, he, we heard him say it at the beginning. He wanted to show her. He didn't want to kill her. He didn't want to, he could have killed her at any point, but he wanted to show her. He wanted to change her. He wanted to give her this new gift that he's got. And 
Karen uh, makes her way up to the the office as well, and she comes across Terry's body, and then immediately comes across Eddie, who is, I don't know, like he's kind of looking like a zombie. Well, I guess so. You I mean, know, he has just come back from the dead. You know, he's still got his bullet wounds in his face. That's it. He's he's kind of still rejuvenating or doing the best he can with with what he's got. But the we then properly watch the effect of him turn. Well, you got that awesome moment where he ad libbed this line, like "Let me give you a piece of my mind" yeah. as he's pulling the bullet out of his head. I was like, "You not you not done that already?" I guess he was saving it for this moment to yeah. really scare her. Yeah. And yeah, it is like a three, three and a half minute, maybe four minute transformation sequence. Now, I, I, I give you that, that dramatically, it's a little bit off when you consider that uh, that Karen just stands there the whole time and this yeah. transformation is happening. I can understand being paralyzed by fear, uh, you know, but for the whole duration, it seems a little bit off yeah but you know but that's because we are as an audience being treated to a special effects extravaganza yeah now we can only imagine that in the in i guess in reality this transformation is happening quicker than the film may be suggesting uh but you know watching watching the fur grow out watching the face change watching uh you know the the fingers and the claws elongate yeah you know this was this is absolutely revolutionary for the time never seen anything like it uh, well, but, not for at least a couple more months. True, true. <laughs> uh, but you know, Rob Bottin and Rick Baker, you know, yeah. the, the height of their game. Yeah, they did. And yeah. Uh, you know, it is you know watching it now, like going from VHS, like you couldn't tell, but watching it now in HD, you're just like oh. you can easily see when Robert Picardo transitions into a puppet head. Yeah. You know, because he's much more animated, whereas the puppet head is very still. Yeah. Um, and you know, it, it's all in the eyes as well. You can see that it's not when real the eyes turn over. Yeah, I'm like, yeah, oh. the eyes just roll up and roll down yeah um and uh you know but you know they mask it fairly well by some camera movement you know uh, yeah at at least the muzzle is 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 wet and dripping with saliva and goo yeah Uh, it helps bring the puppet to life see now it was at this point like i said i'd always thought i'd heard that this movie was kind of like a black comedy but it was by this point i'm like okay maybe i've missed all the comedy because this movie is like eight ninth level horror you know, and, and like you said, with Karen not running, yeah, you might want to, traditionalists, you want to say to the horror character, get out of there! But technically, you want them to stand there because you want to see as much as you can on camera as and just be amazed by or the horrified. Effect, or yeah, horrified. I mean, we're, we're kind of seeing this through the eyes of Karen, this yeah. transformation. But she grabs some acid and she just lobs it at the wolf's face and then she runs out and she's 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 grabbed by two people. And they take her to the barn. And it's at this point, if you haven't realized by this point, it's it's this is the big reveal. This is the big story drop that she's taken to the barn and everybody's there. Marsha, Dr. Wagner, Donna, her 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 neighbor, Terry's body is left there. You know, TC's missing his arm, and we realize that he was one of the wolves. And everybody in the colony, barring Karen, is a shapeshifter. <laughs> we should have stuck with the old wings. Raising cattle for our feed. Where's the life in that? The humans are our cattle. The humans are our prey. Now, I just want to bring up a small bit of trivia here for you for yeah. the film. This is something. There are many, many hidden Easter eggs, some more subtle than others in yeah. this film. But one of the ones that stands out so much is the fact that almost every character in this film yeah. is named after a director of a werewolf movie. Oh, For really? instance, uh, Dr. George Wagner, yeah. um, played by Patrick McNee. George Wagner is the director of The Wolfman. Terry Fisher, yeah. uh, played by uh, Belinda Blasky, of course, also from Gremlins and Piranha fame. She's named after Terence Fisher, uh, who directed The Curse of the Werewolf. <laughs> <laughs> you know, you, you've got you got Kevin McCarthy who plays Freddie Francis. He was the director of Legend of the Werewolf. I'm noticing you know, a pattern the, here. The, there are so like almost all the names in this film they're named after uh, werewolf directors. I'm just like that. That's just brilliant. But again, there, there's loads of Easter eggs like on on like the newspaper clippings. Yeah. The books that characters are reading. You know, it's either got the wolf in them or it's called the wolf. It's just like it's so led. Like it's a film buffs you know dream. Yeah, it's, just to it spot is. all of these these things. It is. We need this shelter to plan, to catch up with society. Times have changed, and we haven't. Not enough. 
they come to this kind of argument, and I, I suppose this is where I get a little bit confused with where the story is going for. Yeah, for the, this. the werewolves are, uh, you know, they're they're at disagreements with each other. Well, that's it. But it's like, okay, so some of them aren't happy that Karen was brought to the colony. Some of them are wanting to control the animal inside and only let it out when they. Well, that's what Dr. Take. Wagner's trying to do with this colony is, is you know, because he says it right at the beginning of the film. It's all about controlling your, uh, your impulses. Yeah, but it just seems to be like, it seems they're trying to tell you that there's this secret society that's been living among us for all these years, um, you know, and that they kind of want to become, they want to get out and be free, but they also want to hide it because they don't know how they'll be accepted. But then you have people like Eddie who are complete psychopaths and will go out on a bit of a killing spree in in New York. Now, I'm, I might be slightly convinced that Eddie going to New York and then Dr. Wagner going to New York was just timing. And Dr. Wagner was there to try to find Eddie. And bring him back. And, and try, to bring him down him, and try to bring him back. But he didn't do it very well. He just went out there and fucking advertised his book. To, to me, it seemed like he was trying to advertise more people to come to the colony to become shapeshifters. You know, it's like when Billy gets bitten at the colony, he doesn't even say anything. It's like Dr. Magna goes, well, there's one more for dinner, I suppose. You know, oh, well, we'll just have to try to convince Karen. Why didn't you just scratch Karen when she came in? I mean, you got Billy so fucking easily. Why didn't you just scratch Karen if you didn't want her to change? But, it's, but it just leads to this bit of an argument inside the barn where Marsh is like, no, Dr. Wagner, we're not with you. And Dr. Wagner's like, please, I'm trying to help you. And poor Karen's there like, am I getting eaten or, or what? Am I turned or can I get out of here? Can, now? I, can, can I just leave? Like, is it anything to do with me? Am I just the innocent and all this? Well, I, I understand that Dr. Wagner wanted to, you know, to at least... Um, get her back to some level of normality because she was still, you know, really fragile. She's suffering from the experiences at the beginning. Telling her she's living among shape-shifting werewolves well, I guess is the, not going to get her back the, to real. The cat was out of the bag at this point because of oh, Eddie, Eddie ruining his plans. But it's like with, with John Carradine, like we said, at the, at the bonfire, he was wanting to kill himself. He's had enough of this existence. Are yeah. they immortal? Um, I don't know. It's hard to say. That's what I'm... Because John Carradine is, is an... If... If they're not immortal, then he's an older werewolf. And yeah. he's been around for a long time. And it's getting to the point now where he's just kind of sick of it. Well, yeah. If he, if he's, sick if, of if what? He's, if he's You're been, immortal, you He's fucking... being forced to repress his animal instincts, you know? And no. try to live civilized when there's nothing for him to do. From what we get from the colony, only during the day. At night time, run free. Yeah, well, they, we, we hear free. them every night ex running ex free. Yeah. Exactly. So... Fucking pick one. You ever want to run free as a werewolf or you want to walk on two feet like a mortal. You can't be both because we'll shoot you with silver bullets. It's what we've been doing for 200 years, you knobs. But, like I said, it, it's my, uh, where I get a little bit confused because I'm just like, okay, what was the whole point of bringing Karen here? You know, in the book, uh, it was a, a, she was the product of a rape. Yes. You know, and so she went to the village to get away. So there was no real connection until she gets to the village and turns out that they're all werewolves. In this, it's like Dr. Wagner was trying to help Eddie, but Eddie escaped and he's trying to help Marsha as well, but none of them really want help and they all hate it. <laughs> but luckily, you know, the director of a bunch of Adam Sandler movies turns up, you know, and he just starts handing out Adam Sandler movies to people in bullet form. <laughs> like, blam, blam, you know, and you get a few of them, you know, who are... Oh, you can't kill us. Oh, he has that confrontation with Eddie, doesn't he? That's the that's the best one. He comes across Eddie, who's, uh, you know, he's, he's still trying to rejuvenate, but he's got half a melted face from the acid thrown in there. And he's just egging Chris on because he doesn't think Chris can deal with him. He's like, fucking kill me. Go on. The fuck are you going to do? And Chris is like, blam, blam, silver bullets, motherfucker. <laughs> Come on, bright boy. Yeah, he's now the film's hero, really. Hell yeah. Yeah, we saw him racing along to go get the silver bullets from Dick Miller to now blasting away Eddie and then roaring up to the barn uh, to save Karen. It's that bit of that, like, I, the whole bit of the gas station was unneeded. Yeah. Like, he drives up the gas station like, it's Hey, buddy, I'm in a hurry! And the guy goes, hey, wait a minute. And then he cuts <laughs> to someone else. I'm like, 
Is that supposed yeah. to be funny? Like, well, it's to show that he's, he's trying really hard to get there very quickly. Yeah, it's like, yeah, they could, well, they can't give away the information. But he turns up and he, he, he shoots TC. Um, he shoots another wolf. And then Dr. Wagner confronts him and says, oh, yeah, it's not real. He's not going to kill me. And Dr. Wagner is killed as well. And uh, he actually thanks him. For, for killing him. He's yeah. just like, thankfully, you know, it's it's over now for him. He doesn't, you know, all the stress of trying to contain these these people, it's all over. He knows he's kind of failed at it, and he's like, he doesn't have to worry anymore. Oh, but... I kind of feel sorry for him, but... Yeah, I do as well, but they... They they left it too long. Like, if he tried to be that bit more humane before Chris had turned up, you know, maybe... Because I, I was like, is he going to try to help Karen? Is he going to try to protect her? Is he the one wolf that is going to do that? No, no. But she... I guess he couldn't control his his you know his his pack. Yeah. Um. So yeah, the uh you know there was too many alphas, and so that's why they started you know infighting. Really. Well, stop bringing people up here and turning them. <laughs> yeah, that's the problem. Just oh you well, hey when you come up to the colony. <laughs> well, he had no control over you know over over which, who gets turned. These wolves are acting out on their own now. <sighs> The problem with 30 days of night as well just people just doing what they want but anyway they they lock all the wolves inside the barn and they start to cover the outside with with uh gasoline and they just set fire yeah. to the whole thing you know we'd already been told at the start that silver bullets will fire was only the real way to kill a werewolf which i don't think's true i'm pretty sure a rocket launcher would do it or, probably or yeah. driving over with a tank yeah yeah, yeah that might do it too um, but we then, obviously, we head back to the city. You know, Chris is a bit upset that his girlfriend's been eaten, you know. Um, and Karen is attacked. I mean, well, actually, we see all the wolves inside the barn. Yeah. We see a bunch of them get burned. But then we see another bunch of them attack the car. Yeah, so clearly a lot of them managed to get out of the barn. Yeah. Well, we saw the wolves breaking down the walls anyway. Yeah, well, so. that's it. Like, is there more people in the surrounding area? How big is the colony? Um, and then we do get one wolf that attacks and bites Karen. And when it's shot, we realize that it's Billy yeah. that they've just killed because we see the tattoo on his arm. Um, and so when they return back to the city, uh, Fred, the old man at the station, who's just another iconic 50s, 60s great actor, um, he's, he's wanting to get Karen back onto the show. But at the same time, he's a bit cautious because he knows that she's literally just gone through like some shit because they are actually on the news giving out the fact that the colony has just burned down yes yeah you know and and hundreds of people might be dead there and karen gives this whole piece which i think is actually one of the the best and probably the most frightening thing in the whole howling movie maybe the whole series is her uh report on it yeah well she's decided like like no one's gonna believe what happened there yeah so if she can deliver this on live news the, there will be, you know, it's 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 one hundred percent, you know, proof of of what she's talking about. And so, yeah, she she stops reading the teleprompter. She starts recounting her story, you know, and you know, you see the tears streaming down her eyes because she knows, you know, this is it for her. Yeah. And uh, and the transformation begins. She's decided she's going to turn into a werewolf on on national live on, television on to TV? prove that these things are amongst us. What is this? Wow. What are you kids watching? The newsletter's turned into a werewolf. Oh boy. You know, the, I, I always found this transformation a little bit weak. Yeah, I did. Um, it's like and, a chihuahua. And, 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 and that was because um, uh, Dee Wallace and, and Joe Dante uh, and Rob Bottin, they, they all kind of decided that she should be more feminine. And a little bit friendlier looking because she was the film's protagonist, you know, uh, and uh, yeah, so they decided but... to lighten it a little bit. Plus, they, you know, they were already out of budget. Yes. They were already over scheduled. Yeah. And all of this transformation had to be done like in Joe Dante's office or his back, back lot because, you know, the set was gone. They didn't have the time or the money. So it's all an extreme close up. That's, yeah. Uh, and that's it why just, you get no wide shots. That's I'd why it's no wide shots. They, they're out of money. Shots. They were out of money. I, I'd love some wide shots to really cement her changing seeing the uh, the other people she's working with maybe run away yeah you know but we 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 don't really get that we just get enough and i say yeah it looks like a chihuahua and it's a cross between an ewok and a, and a and a wookie but from everything that i've just gone through for the movie you know maybe that's me just coming off of a high yes you know sure. and i'm like ah oh. but it's the way that you know uh chris dennis dugan's character he pulls out the silver bullets 
and blast her. Yeah. Again, so we know as an audience that she would die and then transform back into, you know, human form again. What you know, but unfortunately, the news anchor, they, you know, they they, they cut the station, cut they cut to commercial. Well, you get to those cuts of different exactly. People. Well, that's that's kind of like the you know again more of the social commentary in the film where you get some people going, ah, it's just special effects. It's amazing what special effects can do today. Yeah, and the kids it's, are like, oh, the woman's turned into a werewolf. Yeah, and so people don't even really believe it. It's like a case, you know, you don't really believe what you see on TV. It's, yeah. Uh, but then we do cut to Marsha. At the bar, at yeah. At the bar. And we're just like, yeah, okay, not, not, you know, not all the wolves died. Some of them are still out there. And uh, and she was originally offered a role uh, in the sequel film as well. Yeah. Uh, but because of, you know, different things, you know, that she wasn't happy with, you know, she backed out of it. Yeah. Hamburger for the lady. How do you want that? How do you want it, honey? Rare. Well, Ian, what were your favourite scenes from The Howling? Oh, man, I see, I had a few, but like I was, like I said, I was so confused with the tone of the movie because I thought it was supposed to be a comedy, but it was more horror. So a lot of my favourite scenes are just, you know, just how how well the director had a shot or an actor. You know, like the opening sequence with Eddie in the booth, you don't see anything. You know, but that's the beauty of it. You know, the the fact you've got the light of the projector going off. You know, you can hear Eddie talking and this noise in the background. And all the way through the movie, Karen's saying she doesn't know what she saw. But you know she's kind of technically just blanked it out. And you kind of technically know what she saw. But the film never really reveals it until when it has to. Uh, the first night at the colony, like I said, when, when Dee Wallace is looking out of the window... You know, it just works really well. You could make it black and white and slap it in the 1930s and you'd have this scream queen, you know, feeling scared because there's something out there in the woods. I, I did like the little uh, nods in the background. I mean, one of the most obvious ones is when Chris and Terry are lying in bed and they're watching the Wolfman. Yes. You yeah, know, yeah. and the Wolfman's uh, giving its report and they hear about how Billy has been bitten by some kind of animal and the old woman gives her a report of, Oh, those who are bitten by the wolf will change into the wolf man. And you're like, oh, film. Oh, I get you, film. The the attack on Terry. I mean, like, I primarily want to say the office stuff with the, the whole change with Robert Picardo. But I honestly think, like, everything from her from the beach. You know, her walking up from the beach and getting the feeling of the, uh, the view and, and piecing together that Eddie had been there. The luring to the house. The attack at the house. The special effect of the arm being chopped off and then turning back into human form. Then her being confronted by Eddie. I mean, I know it's just like, not just one sequence, it's like a full fucking 20 minute sequence. But it just, everything involving Terry's death is just really, really well done and filmed and just builds up. To the point where you f you generally feel bad for her. You know, she's not a, she's not a well-named character. And she doesn't have really a lot of moments in the movie that make you go, Oh, I remember Terry. But when she dies, fuck. <laughs> I, I love the way that the, the wolves do argue. You know, I, yeah, I do get a bit confused by it. But it's, it's nice that this movie said, Hey, there's stuff going on that even you don't realise. You know, it's not just all clean cut and dry that these people like turning into wolves and eating people. Some of them actually had no choice, you know, and it flows into what Karen says at the end of the film when she transforms. Her transformation isn't the strongest in the movie, but Dee Wallace's performance cements it with her saying like, look, we try our best to be good people or bad people. And then sometimes in the world, we get that choice completely taken away. You know, do you have control when you are the wolf or is it the wolf and you're lost? If you're in control and you kill, are you enjoying it? You know, it's a moral dilemma. Yeah, yeah, so many great moments in the film. Um, I think the first one I'm going to bring up is Dick Miller. He's always fantastic <laughs> to watch. And watching him explaining shapeshifters and werewolves. You yes. know, Dick, Dick Miller even went on to say that of all of the hundreds of film roles he's ever had, this Walter Paisley was his favourite one to play in all of his appearances. <laughs> yeah, because that mopping wasn't any good. <laughs> uh, I, I love the moonlit, misty forests. They were fantastically uh, created. You know, the, the, the mist... The, the the mist, the moon, the trees, the framing, the, the music just perfectly captured the mood and the atmosphere. 
Uh, the werewolf attack in the office, that was brilliant. Like, yeah. uh, Terry's death, just, you know, really scary, really frightening stuff. Captured incredibly well. Uh, and, of course, the first major reveal of the werewolf. I mean, it's a good 60 minutes into the film, but Eddie's transformation from the sound effects to the music to the visuals, uh, the prosthetic work, uh, the animatronic work, it's all above and beyond excellent and, you know, just blows anything out of the water that we'd seen up until this point anyway uh, and of course the werewolf sex sequence you know it's uh, you, you you won't forget it like it might not be the a favorite scene but it's definitely a memorable one yeah yeah <laughs> well ian do you recommend the howling i do um funnily enough when i sat down to watch the movie last night i didn't think i would be recommending it my memory of watching it is sketchy at best and the two, three times that I'd watched it up to watching it for the review, I honestly hadn't enjoyed The Howling. You know, I, like I said, I can tell you different, better uh, werewolf movies that I would watch over The Howling. But after actually sitting down and watching with it with the mentality of, I want to analyze this movie. I want to see what it is about this movie. I think The Howling won is an absolute amazing uh, werewolf movie. It is different to all of the other werewolf movies out there in the fact that it's got a bit of an intelligence behind it that you wouldn't necessarily put to an 80s horror movie. You know, Dee Wallace is just fucking phenomenal and I find it very hard to actually not find a movie, a scary movie that she's in and not fucking enjoy it simply just on her... Uh, her emoting, her emotions, her this, the the innocent character and the fear I have for her character and how I want them to escape. You know, the, some of the other characters in this movie are kind of forgettable. I mean, Marsha, Marsha is integral, but she's not, for me, she's not memorable. Nice boobs. You know, Dennis Dugan. Like, my boy Dennis Dugan. You know, all those Adam Sandler movies. Hey. Billy, like, he was great. I mean, you remember him for the the, the, the the sex scene change, but as a proper character himself, nothing much. Robert Picardo is phenomenal in this. You could probably just remake The Howling and just have it based around Eddie and Karen and loads of changes. So, yes, I definitely, definitely recommend Howling 1. Oh, hell yeah. This is an absolute must-watch horror movie. I highly recommend you watch The Howling. It's a top-tier werewolf movie that certainly entertains even on repeat viewings. Yes, the film appears quaint by today's standards, but the effects at the time were revolutionary and damn scary. Rob Bottin has always outdone himself and everything he touches has always had a lasting impact and the werewolf transformations here remain outstanding and impressive considering the budget and the time constraints. The music by Pino Donaggio is haunting and memorable and the film has a great colourful presentation with excellent cinematography by John Horror who, you know, who also uh, photographed Gremlins and Inner Space. Nice. The actors were all on top form here. Dee Wallace nailed the part, really delivered that mentally traumatised and fragile character and was a standout, even while surrounded by legendary character actors like Dick Miller and Slim Pickens and John Carradine. It may be slow going at the start, but Joe Dante has expertly crafted the slow burn, rising tension to explosive finale with incredible flair. While hiding a social commentary and many subtle references to all the werewolf movies of the classical era. Excellent stuff for film buffs. This film has all the scares, thrills, mood and atmosphere, effects, performances, style and substance to ensure it remains a cult classic for all time. Watch The Howling. It's one of the best werewolf films ever made. All your nightmares are about to be transformed into one single inescapable fear. When the howling starts, the horror begins. <laughs> Thanks for watching Off The Shelf Reviews. Heaven help you.